The NFL is inching closer to an 18-game season, the WNBA All-Star Game set records. There are plans to transform the area around the Bulls and Blackhawks arena, and later, we take a look at breakdancing's ascendance to the Olympics. It's Wednesday, July 24th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NFL and NFLPA have begun substantial discussions over the implementation of an 18-game season. While formal negotiations have not begun yet, the parties have talked, quote, at a very, very, very high level superficially, according to NFLPA Executive Director Lloyd Howell. The league recently completed its third 17-game season. Roger Goodell expressed his desire for the extended season earlier this year. Adidas has issued a public apology to Bella Hadid, who starred in a photo shoot for the apparel brand that featured shoes from the 1972 Munich Olympics, where 11 Israeli athletes were taken hostage and killed. According to TMZ, Hadid, who is of Palestinian descent, was planning to sue Adidas for its, quote, lack of public accountability over the tone-deaf campaign. Adidas responded saying, quote, we also apologize to our partners, Bella Hadid, Asap Nast, Jules Koundé, and others for any negative impact on them, and we are revising the campaign. The WNBA All-Star Game set a new record with 3.4 million viewers, smashing the previous record of 1.4 million viewers. Last year, only 850,000 people tuned in. The 2024 All-Star Game becomes the 17th WNBA game this season to eclipse 1 million viewers. Yesterday, Chicago's United Center ownership announced intentions to create a $7 billion super complex titled the 1901 Project, converting the 55 acres surrounding the arena into mixed income housing, a music hall, a parking facility, and more. This massive undertaking will take 10 years to complete and will be the largest private investment on Chicago's west side. Musburger Media has reacquired the sports betting network VEASAN from DraftKings, a sign of the rapidly changing sports gambling industry. Upon purchasing back the property, founder Brian Musburger said in a statement that our original vision for VSIN still holds, and we are committed to delivering the most credible, independent information and analysis sports bettors can find anywhere. NFL training camp begins this week, and as always, the faces who are absent are much more of a topic than anyone in attendance. The biggest question surrounds Jets pass rusher Hassan Reddick, who was acquired from the Philadelphia Eagles earlier this year. Reddick is seeking a new deal, which is believed to be part of the reason the Eagles elected to trade their defensive star in the offseason. He is set to make $14.5 million this year in the last leg of his current contract. The Jets had previously offered Reddick a pay bump, according to SNY, but the linebacker declined. It's unlikely that Reddick will be given a full-blown extension, but some believe that the Jets may look to restructure this year's agreement to keep everyone happy. Reddick is subject to $50,000 per day in fines for missing camp. But not all absences are equal. Elsewhere around the league, Chicago Bears safety Jonathan Owens is also missing camp, but he won't be fined a penny for it. The Bears granted Owens, the husband of Olympic star Simone Biles, an excused absence for seven days of training camp so that he could watch his wife compete in person at the 2024 Paris Games. Head coach Matt Eberflus expressed his support to reporters on Monday, saying, That is a big deal, and he's just supporting the one he loves the most. And I think that's so cool that he gets to do that. We welcome that, and it's going to be awesome. Go USA! Joined now once again by Andrew Brandt, Executive Director at the Morad Center for Sports Law at Villanova, host of the Business of Sports podcast and author of the Sunday 7 newsletter. Welcome, Andrew. Yeah, always good to be with you, Owen. Great to have you on as always. The NFL and NFLPA have begun discussions around an 18-game season. Talks are very preliminary at this point, but also feels like something that's going to happen eventually. Where are we at right now in terms of adding an extra game? I think you said it. It feels like something's going to happen eventually, and it feels like that because the NFL seems to get what it wants. I thought Roger Goodell was very nonchalant and almost cavalier about talking about this over a couple of different occasions, not realizing, well, let me say that, realizing that this does have to go through the players, does have to be collectively bargained. In 2020, as everyone knows, the NFL went from 16 to 17 games as a student of the collective bargaining agreement, Owen, I'm still trying to figure out what the players got out of that. I mean, they just sort of gave away another piece of inventory. And here we are again, Roger Goodell saying it as if there's going to be no counter reaction from the NFLPA or whatever counter reaction comes out of it, they feel like they can steamroll it through. 
even if the players want this because you know it's it's more money for for one um they can certainly ask for something and probably something kind of big because this is you know a major chunk of revenue that would get added to the league what do you think they will ask for well, let's talk about what they could ask for, which is a great point. I mean, we've had this revenue split, which has basically been almost 53 owners, 47 players. And by the way, that doesn't include all revenues. Owners don't share naming rights money. They don't share club seat money. They don't share relocation fee money. So it's not really 47, 48%. But obviously getting closer, getting closer to a 50-50 split would be the biggest ask. Then, of course, there's the franchise tag, which continues to depress salaries for the top players. There's commissioner power. And, of course, the little things like getting a two weeks out of bye with an 18-game schedule, I'm sure the NFL will give that. The NFL is always dealing with the union like, hey, the union wants more practice uh, time off and wants more off-season time away from the facility. And I've talked to owners who said, of course. I mean, if, if that's if that's all we have to give to get the economics that we want, of course. I mean, that's the easiest give in the world. And the coaches are all upset. And I've told coaches like, hey, you got to understand you're not party to these negotiations. They're between the players and the owners. And the fact that you don't get to coach players for the entire offseason, except for two weeks, that's you're just a pawn. So the owners are like, hey, we get the economics we want. They can have all the time in the off season they want that's the deal yeah and second bye week in the season do you think that's going to happen i think it would it just depends if the players get serious about asking for something more tangible more meat than that maybe they give up on that but to just get another bye week that seems to be way too light way too easy way too easy to give from the players but again the news here owen is that we thought this would be a CBA thing when the next collective bargaining agreement happens in 2031 is the next one, like seven years away. But reporting out of the Washington Post today says that they may get this done earlier. They may actually talk about it and get what's called a side letter to the existing collective bargaining agreement and says, oh, by the way, you know, we're going from 17 to 18 in 2025, and here's what the players get. So that's really the news. We've heard about 18 games in the next CBA after getting 17 in this CBA, but it could happen much sooner. Yeah. And you brought up the franchise tag. That does seem to be, I mean, obviously it only affects, um, you know, a small number of players, but those players never seem happy to, to get the franchise tag. Um, it's always, you know, extending our control at, you know, at a price that we like for the team. Do you see anything they're potentially giving or are players just stuck with that, at least through the next CBA? Yeah, I mean, if the players feel what you just said, they won't fight. But I've always said it affects a lot more than the 10 or so players a year. The reason is if you're restricting their money and whether they sign a new deal or not, it's less than they could get if they were a free agent. You're restricting everyone's money. So if the top is only making less than they should then the next tier is making less than they should, then the next tier. So my, I negotiated hundreds of contracts for the Green Bay Packers. I never applied the franchise tag. I used the franchise tag in negotiations several times in order to leverage a better deal from the team side. That's the power of the tag, not applying it to the 10 players a year or whatever it is. It's the use in negotiations that happens every day in negotiations. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And speaking of player negotiations, we have a couple of holdouts. Seems to be kind of a standard thing for this time of year at this point. But Hassan Reddick um, is holding out for a contract. What's the the calculus here from the player side? And it's just, you know, I, that's the one thing they can do is withhold their labor and they're valuable enough that they feel the team is going to tr try to bring them to the table somehow. There's two types of contract situations. There's one, which we'll talk about in a minute, like Jordan Love and the Packers, who are engaged in contract negotiations, just a matter of the numbers. These two situations, it appears to me, Owen, that Brandon Ayuk and Hassan Reddick are not in any kind of contract negotiations, and that's what's upsetting them. It's not a question of they're offering this, we're offering that, let's see if we can work it out. My sense is the 49ers have told, subtly or not so subtly, Ayuk and his reps that, yeah, we're just going to, you know, go forward this year. We're not doing a new contract in the last year of your deal. 
and we'll figure it out next year. And the same with Reddick. The complication with Reddick, of course, as you and I talked before we came on, is this is a guy that was traded for. So having been involved in a lot of trades, you talk to the agent. And if the agent is saying, oh, by the way, you know, he's going to need a new contract, that's on the Jets. If somehow when the trade was made, the agent said, oh, we're all good, or the player said that, then that's on Reddick. So it's interesting, and whether the Eagles knew something or not, and whether they should have or did disclose when they traded and got a draft pick for Hassan Reddick. So this is interesting. What did the Jets know from either the Eagles, the agent, or the player, and what's changed now, if anything? This is a, a live live update on the recording. Uh, looks like Brandon Ayuk is reporting to training camp. We're just getting this uh, from Ian Rappaport. Um, so he still doesn't have a new contract yet, but... Yeah. He's showing up. So I mean, that, that often feels like where these things kind of go is the the player ultimately doesn't want to sit out a year. Like they're, they're going to be yeah. less valuable if they're just sitting on the bench and, you know, then show up the next year and say, you know, I've still got it. Someone signed me to that huge deal that I was holding out for before. Um, as much as they have the leverage of they're the only ones who can pick up their body and get on the field, um, the, the team can say, well, we can also just find another guy and and you can just not maybe get the deal that you wanted. Yeah, I feel for Ayuk. I mean, they paid Samuel. They paid a lot of the big time players there. He seems left out in the cold. Not only that, Owen, but they drafted his replacement. First round pick, Ricky Pearsall, Florida State. Probably not ready to step in for Ayuk this year, but hey, it seems to work out where next year Ayuk is off somewhere else and they bring in this first round pick from 2024. He had no leverage. And I will tell you this, having been there, Believe me when I say this, fans and media get much more rattled about contract situations and holdouts than the teams. The teams are like what you just said. They'll be there, you know? And if they're going to be out and if Ayuk misses some practice time, this Pearsall gets more reps. And if Reddick misses practice time, all these young defensive ends get more reps. It's like, yeah, they'll be there. Because this is, sounds very harsh. It sounds harsh, but it's the reality of the business of sports. What else are they going to do? <laughs> like, what's the alternative? There is none. I mean, Le'Veon Bell, one in a million, will, will, will sit out the season. But it just doesn't happen. So they'll be there. And now I'd start to add this. The CBA, which we've been talking about, has extended penalties for holdouts. So there's no good option for players. Speaking, yeah, of Jordan Love, there's there's that situation where that feels like something is gonna gonna get done. I'm curious any other insights you have there. We should also bring in Dak Prescott, who is not holding out, but also doesn't have a new deal. So, um, how, how are you seeing those two? Yeah, with Love, I'm getting a lot of requests from Wisconsin media from my time there. It seems like there's a good vibe. He's he's holding. He's not holding out. You could say it's a love in rather than a hold out. And uh, to me, I mean, I'm a student of these contracts. The only question is sort of how much guaranteed, what's the first three years look like in terms of cash compared to Burrow and Herbert and others? Uh, where is going to be the term of the contract? Is it going to be shorter? It's going to be longer. It's going to get done. I just feel like every side is is saying the right things with Jordan Love. And of course, he's under contract, so Packer fans, don't worry. You're going to have him this year at the at the least. Speaking of having, having him this year at the least, and maybe the most, too, for Dak Prescott, it appears to me that the Cowboys are not engaged in negotiations and are sort of doing this play-it-out year, not only for him, but for Mike McCarthy. I was at that game where the Packers rolled them in the playoffs. I expected Jerry Jones to fire McCarthy the next day. He did not. McCarthy's in the last year of his deal. Prescott's making a ton of money. He's in the last year of his deal. It almost feels like they're going to ride these two and see what happens this year rather than be the usual cowboy mentality, which is go sign him, long-term deal, big bump, big bonus. It feels like that's different this year with the Cowboys, that Prescott and McCarthy are riding this out in the last year of their contracts. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. And Brandt, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Always enjoy it, Owen. Snoop Dogg knows a thing or two about lighting up, so it's only fitting that he was named as one of the final torchbearers for the 2024 Paris Olympics. 
The 52-year-old rapper, who's experienced the birth of a second career in sports, will also be involved in NBC's coverage of the games this year. Over the past two months, the Torch has traveled all around France. Snoop joins a list of international celebrities to earn torch-bearing honors. However, none have been offered the final leg of the journey. Snoop will be carrying the torch through Saint-Denis, a northern Paris neighborhood. Right now, the identity of the final torchbearer, meaning the person who lights the cauldron, is not known. According to ESPN, only a dozen people know who that responsibility will be given to. Some things are better left as a surprise anyway. I'm joined now by Steezy co-founder and CEO, Evan Joe. Welcome, Evan. Thanks, Alwyn. Great to have you on. So breakdancing will be part of the Olympics for the first time this year. How did it become an Olympic sport? Yeah, so uh, breaking actually made its debut in the Youth Olympics in 2018 to a great showing. I think, um, you know, the, the breaking community has always wanted it to be a official sport since, you know, breaking started as battles and competition against each other. Uh, and you even saw um, men's gymnastics floor. They started borrowing a move called the air flare. Uh, into their floor routine. So I think that might have gotten the wheels turning a little bit. But uh, uh, Breaking made a great debut in the Youth Olympics in 2018. Uh, NBC Sports said they got about a million viewers. And of course, the IOC, no surprise, is like trying to really push youth sports and and getting uh, tapping into that Gen Z audience. And so Breaking is a great vehicle for that. And it did so well that they brought it into the Paris Olympics for 2024. How does it work as a sport? I mean, I can sort of, you know, I've seen breakdancing, breaking. Um, it does have this kind of competitive flair to it, you know, but I, I feel like in my mind, the the competition is judged by like the crowd surrounding the dancers and like how loud they cheer. Um, how does it work in terms of like when it's in the Olympics? It's it's always been sort of this competitive angle. So but, you know, of course, most people view view breaking as a dance and art form since uh, it's mainly been viewed that way in the mainstream media. But breaking has always been a very core battle culture, very competitive. Um, Normally, uh, normally you would have three judges and just kind of like giving their opinion on, you know, which which person won out of the total. But I think it was especially with the push of formalizing it into more of a sport. They've been developing a lot more uh, formalized scoring systems. And so um, it's still a one on one battle in the Olympics. But um, each there there's, I believe, five to ten judges. And each judge uh, scores um, the different rounds of, of the dancers. And so, uh, you know, let's say if we're, we're battling each other, right? I go and then you go and then uh, the, the judges will score that round. And so the judges will score that round based on five different categories, um, musicality, originality, execution, um, and all of that. And they have this little iPad with a sliding scale. And then um, they'll, they'll have that round judged. And so best two out of three rounds wins. Um, and that's basically how ju uh, judging is scored. Gotcha. So it sounds like there isn't just room for creativity. Creativity is, you know, it's, yeah. it's part of what you're, you're getting judged on. It's not just, you know, you've spun around on your head five times and so you get five yeah. points and yeah, it's not, not so not quite that technical. Totally. Um, yeah, very cool. Uh, to what degree is there like an organization in like a, you know, is, is breaking like an organized thing, you know, with like, leagues federations all that stuff there's the partnership with more of a top-down model so there's the uh, world dance sport federation that has a good relationship with the ioc um that kind of helps shepherd uh breaking into into the olympics so it's kind of like a grassroots momentum from uh, across all the social platforms and all the people practicing it and then plus partnering with uh folks like the the world dance sport federation that has that ioc relationship is is there a sort of the world community a of um a, of breakers who are not uh, not competitive or is if you're breakdancing is it like once you get at least a little bit serious about it, it it's a competitive thing yeah totally I, I think there's different avenues to sort of uh professional b-boy or dancer there's there's the um, there's the traditional path, which is like, Hey, I'm a dancer and I'm going to move to Hollywood, try to get booked in music videos, dance for artists, go on tour, all of that. Um, but thanks to obviously like more, more grassroots movements, YouTube and, and all these, um, brand sponsors trying to, uh, uh, participate now in, in, in breaking and dance. And they're seeing, seeing that as a, a big potential opportunity. Uh, you do have a lot more avenues to, to be a pro b-boy and actually just uh, stick to your craft and really like hone in your competition 
Um, and so you have, you know, Red Bull BC one that you can compete on, you go on tours and all of that. And so that's like, that's kind of the traditional path uh, uh, of b wing. And then of course, there's also the instructional element of it. And so, um, you know, different groups around the world uh, are inviting these dancers to their areas in order to host these breaking clinics. I'm sure that happens with a lot of other sports as well. And so you see like from the participation angle, people inviting um, these pro dancers over. Um, and, and that's what we sort of do as DZ. We just make that as, as accessible as possible with an online platform. And, and we're working with some of the top uh, dancers and b-boys around the world in order to uh, really make it easy for people to participate. And is that sort of steady move toward professionalization, organization, has that been like fully welcomed in the b-boy, b-girl community? Or is there any like pushback there? Yeah, I mean, there's always pushback when it comes to like formalizing, formalizing a, a sport, you know, it's, breaking is super young, it was only, you know, created in the 80s compared to the, the decades or, or over 100 years of other other traditional sports. And, and there's always going to be a faction, like, you know, even when you think about basketball, there's like the street ballers versus the NBA, right? Like, I think that's happening in the breaking world as well. But overall, everyone's just super excited. Um, and overall, everyone's uh, just down to have more opportunities for for breakers, like putting putting breaking on a world stage and introducing it to more people. Like, obviously, a lot of people are paying attention to the Olympics and some subset of that will discover breaking through the Olympics and maybe they'll try it out. Maybe their kids will try it out. Um, and you know, it's just really cool to watch human bodies do these crazy spins and flips and things like that's what got me hooked at first. Um, and yeah, what do you think it's going to mean for the, you know, the broader breaking community to have it on this global stage? Yeah, I think it opens up a lot of doors. Um, and you know, it, I think it'll really cement in people's mind that dance will be and can be a sport. And so I think that just opens up the doors for, for a lot more, um, a, a lot more different people a lot more different um uh, categories dance potentially um and so i think you know uh we're we're hopeful for for a future where uh dancers can really be athletes on their own and i think the the olympics is the first step to that and anything else you would say about yeah the the world you would like to see for for b-boys and b-girls yeah i mean uh you know selfishly i was i was a b-boy at first too and so it's always great to see people like uh, be able to make a living competing. I think that's where you get the most innovation is from like really uh, competing and you see, you know, people try to create new original moves. You have people like pushing the envelope of, of these, these different moves. Like for example, uh, uh, you know, air flares were like, used to be like the pinnacle of b-boying and now people are doing like one handed air flares and like, the, like, like at some point we're going to get like two, two, uh, two, you know, one handed air flares. Like it's, it's just crazy to see like the, that being pushed. So, uh, yeah, future, you know, being able to keep dancers competitive, I think will grow the sport overall. And I think just give more opportunities. Um, and we're starting to see that, you know, brands are, brands are starting to take notice and, and sponsoring these athletes, just like any other sport, um, so that they can stay focused and really, um, you know, push their craft. Yeah. And as you know, the, someone, uh, heading up one of these, these brands, um, are, are you just seeing any differences, um, even before the Olympics in terms of, you know, who's showing up, who wants to be part of this, uh, you know, who, who wants to, you know, work with you, that, that kind of thing. You see a lot more brands getting interested. Like, you know, people are, are, are obviously brands are looking at the Olympics, like, Hey, what are all the categories we can get involved in and, and breaking kind of like perks their ears and they start doing a lot more, um, you know, research into this space overall, like breaking is one of our cat many dance categories. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot more demand there. And then of course, uh, we focus on the education side, getting people um, the right instruction from the right instructors available at home. And so, uh, you know, we think that this will just grow the pie overall and encourage a lot more people to participate. All right. Well, looking forward to checking it out. Evan Joe, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Cool. Thanks a lot, Owen. Reddit is leaning into sports as it looks to drive up its value as a public company. The network of internet communities has signed deals with the NFL, NBA, and MLB that will put more game highlights, behind-the-scenes videos, and player AMA sessions on the platform. Advertisers will also be able to put their content alongside videos from the leagues. The PGA Tour and NASCAR are also working with the platform. Reddit rose to prominence through its user-driven content and ethos, but it's also become more willing to strike deals with major companies since hitting the markets in March. Front Office Sports announced the 2024 recipients of our Most Sustainable in Sports Award. The winners include Liverpool FC, Gillette Stadium, NC State Athletics, and Sale GP. 
Go to frontofficesports.com to check out the full list. And thanks to the winners for doing their part for the planet. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, please tell a friend and share this episode with the NFL and breakdancing fans in your life. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.